Um, well, today we have our three experts um, here with us, and um, we've had an opportunity to spend the morning with them at the forum, really talking about their models of practice for creating sustainable communities. So this afternoon, we'd like to talk a little bit about Fairfield, where we are, get some tips on how to move forward, um, what to anticipate, and so it's an opportunity for a much more one-on-one -on -one dialogue with them. I'm curious in your cities what um, the garbage collector, the waste management, how that's handled. In our, um, in our town, we have um, waste management and how, what the sustainability director, what, what you have in the, this is hard to, <laughs> to talk, what plan there is or for interfacing with waste management in the Fairfield sustainability plan and what uh, models the city of Ames and Dubuque um, are using? Well, in the city of Ames, this is a really interesting model um, because we have a big concern of um, impacting uh, economic, um, um, I guess, freedom and consideration of um, local businesses. So we do not have one provider. In fact, residents um, actually sign up individually according to the provider they are interested in having serve them. And I will say that right now, I guess last count, we maybe have at least seven different companies providing refuse um, services. Down my own street, I see a different garbage truck every day. Uh, so I am really looking forward um, to our climate action planning for a number of different reasons, but one of them is really to get our arms around how we can consider our refuse collection and how that can certainly embrace our local economy and the providers to it, but also really being mindful of our uh, collective carbon footprint. All right, so in the city of Dubuque, uh, our public works department is responsible for um, trash collection. We just, um, our resource management coordinator and supervisor just took a new position within the city and so we're in the process of hiring someone and um, I don't know how successful I will be but I keep sending them job announcements that um, include sustainability measures and initiatives for that position because I think a lot of, of um, sustainability efforts could be included in it. Um, we have policies in which our trash collectors will um, note if you're not recycling correctly or um, if you're if you are um, like not filling up your trash bin you could go for a, a lower rate in a smaller bin. Um, they're supposed to be putting notices on but in practice that's not really happening. So there is room for improvement. Um, the other thing I was going to cover Hmm. Oh, so the city collects for up to four plexes, and then after that, it is a separate company. And um, we have a really good relationship with with the owner of the company, and try to um, do as much as we can with him. But he reminds me a lot that he is a capitalist, and <laughs> that's his bottom line. <laughs> and and his bottom line is really important. But. Um, He's, he's been a willing partner and he's also willing to fund other efforts, so um, he's a good, good supporter of, of my work. You all three addressed it slightly before, but um, not, not terribly much. The economic positives that come out of your work thus far, do you, I'd like to hear more about them and I'd like to, because we find in our work communicating with different people that it's always one of the first questions that come up, right? And um, I heard you reference it, but I was wondering if you could be a little bit more detailed about the kind of economic gains that have occurred in your communities as a result of your work so far. All right. So. Um I'm bad on the details if I don't have a paper in front of me, so I, I, that's why I hesitate to uh, go into specifics around, around this, but um, Dubuque considers that a lot of our sustainability initiatives have helped us attract businesses, um, job creators. Um, then there's like the very um, easy to calculate savings that we've had from 
energy efficiency improvements, um, upgrading our wastewater treatment facility, capturing the gas, those all have very tangible benefits. Um, but like the actual dollar amounts, I don't know. Um, with our B Branch flood mitigation project, we have um, estimates of um, diverted money. So what, um, what money we would have spent on disaster recovery or cleaning up basements or mold remediation. Um, we have estimates of that going away because of the, the flooding isn't happening anymore in that area. Um, so those are just a couple of examples and I would be happy to share our case studies with you where you could see actual dollar amounts attached to them that I don't wanna butcher <laughs> on camera. Um, but very much we consider our sustainability work um, as economic development. And um, like we've been able to attract companies because they say, hey, our folks, our young workforce um, are asking what about sustainability in this city or what are they doing to address climate action? The other thing um, that our budget office is now in tune to are the Moody's ratings. And um, with a climate action plan, we get a better rating because we have this climate action plan because they're thinking economically, um, what are, <laughs> like, um, what's your risk? And so um, as we consider risk, there's also savings there. Good question. I've discovered a couple of things. It's probably not going to be a surprise here. Um, when it comes to planning, there's very few funding sources to plan. But if you get a plan, you can find money lots of times. But there's also little to no money to evaluate as well. I find that to be a very big challenge for us also. Um, so I don't have really good evaluation of specifically the West Union Project. Now, there is work going on right now to develop some case studies from the users of the geothermal system. It's super hard to do though, because almost, actually I think in every building, either the use of the building has changed, or they're conditioning spaces of the building they weren't conditioning before, or both. I mean, example, one building that now has a restaurant and six apartments upstairs, it was the school district's bus barn, and it was unconditioned, it had buses parked in the front window when the project started. So it's been really hard to get numbers there. Where we do get some numbers though is on our housing projects, disaster recovery housing, because of our energy performance requirements, we do get uh, a home energy rating system index or performance measurement at the end. And on those we can show if they build to our Green Streets criteria, we're saving five or 600, maybe $1,000 a year versus a base you know, uh, home built uh, code. So we can kind of show some benefits in that avenue. We've also, from our downtown work, because we house the Downtown Resource Center, <clears throat> uh, hired a gentleman named Donovan Ripkema a few years ago who actually did some studies in downtowns all across Iowa, looking at the, the benefits of maintaining and fixing up and revitalizing buildings that are downtowns. And the, the numbers came out about, if you've got a vacant building downtown, it's probably costing your community Two hundred to two hundred twenty thousand dollars a year because you've got lower property tax assessments, property taxes being collected. You have no sales tax being collected. You don't have them buying any local products, supplies, or services. So it's expensive to have a vacant building downtown. On the flip side, his numbers also showed, depending on um, whether you're renting at five hundred or a thousand dollars a month, an upper story apartment, each one adds twenty to forty thousand dollars a year to a local economy, particularly in the downtown, if you can um, add those upper story apartments into those vacant spaces in your downtown. So we've looked at some numbers like that. In the West Union case, we did do, uh, the consultants designing the project helped do some evaluation comparing different types of pavement surfaces and looking at long-term costs. And that was a, a guiding factor that I think that helped make the case for porous pavements. Um, on the other hand, the geothermal system, like we were talking about this a little bit ago, you know, in 2008, 2009, all our projections were uh, gas would keep going like this and electricity would keep, would go about like this. And soon after we started the project, uh, gas prices went like that and electric alliance prices have gone like this. So um, I think everybody's kind of still breaking even or making a little bit of money, but maybe not the savings we had anticipated just because of what gas and electric markets have done since that project started. Well, I would talk on a couple of 
different angles. And, uh, and I would also, um, certainly there are, are um, metrics that we have been tracking. I would also say that I will echo what Gina mentioned, and without the experts here actually tracking those, I would hate to give specific numbers. But one thing I would say from the standpoint of the city of Ames is the first challenge put forward to me as their sustainability coordinator was put together a task force to try to alleviate the need to increase capacity at our power plant and we still have the same power plant. So, you know, the um, initiatives that were put forward, the goals that the individual sectors set for themselves and the reality of what the cost increase to them would be in doing that, I think really resonated um, because we're still there. I would also mention that there have been a couple of interesting sort of peer-to-peer -peer sharing opportunities and, um, uh, you know, gleaning ideas that have been particularly instrumental in our community. And I think that that um, primary one has come through the Smart Business Challenge that I mentioned. And that really is a peer-to-peer -peer sharing opportunity. One of the first pieces actually related to that um, taking part in the challenge is having a um, commercial audit completed for your business, an energy audit. Now, one thing I would say, and I think this is um, true uh, in communities uh, across Iowa, is that the City of Ames offers a free energy audit to any resident, any business, and from a business standpoint, um, can offer uh, different um, um, pieces related to an energy audit, a plug load audit, um, you know, consideration of what may be happening related to manufacturing uh, business. So different audits according to what resonates the most with that particular business. And uh, that can do a couple of things. It can offer opportunities. And we've had a lot of aha moments. Even though this has been a program that we have offered for years, it honestly took uh, committing to a challenge or joining that competitive spirit to be a part of the Smart Business Challenge that for a lot of businesses uh, allowed them to realize, oh, this is a free service? Wow, I didn't even realize that. Um, and, and that there were other businesses doing it, right? So an audit kind of feels like, is it something that the city's trying to catch me at something, you know? But if you, if you're, uh, you know, if you have another business, your peers are doing it, okay, fine. You know, we're going to take the challenge. We want that medal, you know? We Want that certification too and so there's been a lot of aha moments I think in realizing some of the really quick payback opportunities that have substantial savings for the businesses um, I would note that lighting is such a low-hanging piece of fruit and there's so many of our businesses that still have really old inefficient lighting and the payback is so significant and so quick now with the increase in technology that I think has been across the board our biggest um, change that we have seen with a lot of our businesses is uh, going in and changing out their lighting and then being able to say, yeah, our electricity bill reduced 50%. We didn't realize that, you know, that would happen. Um, and then, you know, another part of the audit is that if there are major changes that are completed, then we offer a follow-up energy um, audit to see the impact of those changes and really have that on paper, you know, for our businesses. And I think that's been significant. Um, we also offer uh, for any business that you know is interested a what we call a, a power tracks uh, report and that really even though they get their monthly bills we put those bills together and we um, identify trends for them um, seasonal you know differentiation so that might assist them in maybe just finding an adjustment to a system that's causing um, a big uh, um, increase in energy or even water consumption those sorts of things um, so I think that's been an important piece from a university level one thing that I would say the economics for sustainability Gina mentioned you know attracting new businesses for us students are very interested in a university's commitment to sustainability when I first started my position um, a national survey showed that about 40 um, percent of incoming freshmen noted sustainability as one of the primary pieces they considered now that's over 60 percent of incoming freshmen so this is significant our students want to know that we are making you know that commitment from an operational standpoint one thing that we did is we put uh, meters um, in all of our buildings 
so that we could specifically determine what building was using the most energy. Otherwise, it was just the entirety of campus is using X amount. So we were able to pinpoint it to buildings. That allowed us then to look further into having discussions with um, building occupants, building supervisors, even the department or the college that you know, owned, quote unquote, those buildings, paid the bills related to those buildings to determine uh, where challenges might be related to some system not functioning as it should. And that, that recommissioning standpoint and that individual metering, metering has made a big difference. I would also say that to really put the savings um, into a uh, real relevant um, consideration is we adjusted our budget model for utilities um, at Iowa State. And instead of having a uh, one, you know, there's looking at our overall consumption and then uh, splitting that overall consumption by the amount of gross square footage assigned to a particular college. So we did it all by colleges or, or business units. We now base it on the metering system and you pay what you use. And if you don't use as much, uh, and then, you know, uh, from year to year, if the campus saved energy, well, the savings went back to the general university budget. Now, it specifically is retained by that college that incorporates that savings for them to determine how they want to use it. This has funded new positions. This has offered new opportunities for our students. These are the real personal motivator there as well. Who does the the audits that you were saying when you take the energy bills and you of businesses and compare them? Like, who's are you doing that? Who's doing that? Who's doing the energy audits themselves? Yeah, like who's, who's offering that service? So the city contracts with the Iowa Energy Group. Okay. We contract with an outside entity just because yeah, we don't have the staff and the and the and the resources to be able to do it. <laughs> um, but it's such an important function to be able to offer. Um, we really have found that the savings to the community, you know, does pay off. Thanks for your presence here. You've had a, a, a full day now to get a feel for Fairfield and where we're at with our process. My question has two parts. One is a process, the other is a position. And just following on what we talked about before, any advice on funding for the sustainability coordinator? Because I think that's just absolutely critical and central to all of this. Second part about the process is, you know, Jeff, when you described you know, doing community visioning process and, and going into the schools and talking with them and then getting on board state and federal resource people, I mean, that I think shows, if you can get those people at the table, shows that there are economic benefits to this and you start to get a much broader base of support for the, for the process and, and you know, a plan that's gonna be in place. And along with that, you know, kind of what you want to comment about that is what about our students? Because from my experience over, you know, 40 years of working in schools, they can open doors that might not otherwise open um, and open hearts and wallets and things like that. So what, what role could they have in this overall process then? So the position, what can we do to get that funded and then what the process might look like? Yeah, okay. So I am full time with the city of Dubuque. Um, and it's primarily general fund, but there's also stormwater fees that come pay some solid waste, like little little snippets of money. Um, it just magically appears in my account every <laughs> every month. Um, but uh, in terms of funding for a new position, gosh, that was like before my time. I'm I'm not well versed in it. I do think there. Are, I was talking to my table, um, and there are lots of resources once you have a person um, in place and and a great community of sustainability coordinators in the state and in the region and nationally that you can tap into. Um, I don't know. Do you have any brilliant ideas about? <laughs> how to fund this. I do think um, your point to involving students is really important. And um, I mentioned our Teen Resiliency Corps, um, and they weren't, they weren't fundraising or anything, but they definitely were a presence in their neighborhoods, and it shifted the relationship, and it got people talking about resiliency. And so that is a potential model for at least, you know, when you start to, when people, it becomes a household phrase that people are talking about resiliency or sustainability or climate action. Um, then when you do go and say like, hey, would you be willing to put this money for this? Um, it's like, oh yeah, I've been hearing about that. That's important. Um, 
the other thing I was also talking about at my small table over lunch was our franchise fee with Alliant Energy. This is super unpopular and I probably shouldn't be seeing it on a recorded video, but um, there's a lot of money that um, we get back from the energy company that we could be using in our city and in other places to fund climate action or positions um, that we're not using. And so there's, um, that's a potential to look into. I don't know what your, um, who, who serves you or what your franchise agreement looks like, but um, I would look there because there's a lot of money there. Yeah, I have to be honest, I don't have, if I think about it for a while, maybe I'll come up with some, but I think I'd already been asked the question before about funding for the coordinator position and it's not easy. I think you're going the right route with sharing it with the university, the city and private industry. I encourage you not to give up on the county. It's, that's, it's not an unusual situation, I don't think, across Iowa. What I try to drive home, particularly when we're doing our downtown assessments, is you know what's good for downtown is good for the city, but it's great for the county. If you look at what the county gets from a property tax standpoint, um, those downtowns are really key to the overall financial health of those counties and what and then gives them the resources to do the other things they want to do in the unincorporated areas. Um, the student side of things, um, an idea I was having, why well, actually you, you mentioned uh, kind of the technical services core. I was thinking actually about the AmeriCorps program because sometimes the, the AmeriCorps program through the National Corporation for Community Service um, well, oftentimes has summertime positions, sort of like quarter time AmeriCorps positions. So maybe there's some opportunity to look at some sort of projects that are in your plan or as you plan, as you plan that they could help in implementing through maybe like a summer AmeriCorps type of program or I don't know if it was the big green summer, I don't know if I got that right or not, if that program is still operating down here. Or even I would just think of an example of uh, what Bloomfield did, you wouldn't need an AmeriCorps program necessarily to do this, but they partnered with the Green Iowa AmeriCorps program, and one summer in their school, they actually um, had three or four uh, AmeriCorps members there for several weeks, and the uh, AmeriCorps members were going through, and they were uh, removing and putting up the new light fixtures in the school, and the school electrician was going right behind them and doing the actual connections but I think they're saving like $30,000 a year now in that building just on their uh, energy costs. And that was a way that you know, they, they involved youth in the actual improvements and, and uh, kind of exposed them to the whole idea of energy conservation and efficiency measures. So that could be a way. There's, um, um, we talk about some tactical urbanism types of approaches too when we do our downtown assessments. So, that's kind of like taking an, uh, a vacant lot or maybe there's a street you want to improve or maybe you already have something like this where you want to tackle a block and you know paint several homes or clean up several yards. All those kind of community service opportunities. Most, a lot of schools today have silver cord programs or they have community service days where they actually partner with local businesses and engage the students um, one or two days out of the school year and do community services. There's a great example up in Grettinger, Iowa, a smaller town that has, um, I think about a third of their high school students are involved and they're partnered with businesses and they've got 40 different little entrepreneurial projects going on with the businesses and working with students. So I think there's lots of ways to engage uh, students in your efforts um, from the planning to the implementation. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, do we have in mind to do some community visioning process over the next few months and something like that? And what, what does it take to get those other people at the table, you know, especially on the federal level for a town with 10,000 people? Yeah, and selfishly, I mean, we've got the kids stirred up, you know. Now we got to do something. Otherwise, it's going to just be another one of those things and they're going to roll their eyes the next time because they patiently listened all morning long and now I want to do you know I want to take it forward and I'm going to I'm going to engage Anne for sure and whoever else on helping them envision and planning some next step and we can talk about this offline but I you know I, and then I want them the the whole vision is that it becomes authentic 
it's not a school project. It's, it's actually, they present for the mayor or they actually are appointed to the task force if they apply and prove their, you know, something like that. So I guess, you know, how do we leverage our students? And, um, and then we have to go, so then you can talk about, um, you know, what you want to do as a community too and we'll follow up. I think a lot of times to get those state and federal partners, you just need to ask them and they need to know you're interested. Now, sometimes the hard part is finding out who they are, and that's where I can help. That's, that's really my expertise. If I have an expertise, it's, it's connecting the dots with the people. Um, and it comes from the very first round, early days of great places where I helped bring together, I think, about maybe 20 agencies in Little Coon Rapids and White Rock Conservancy getting it off the ground to uh, what you saw from West Union this morning. So... You know, a lot of those agencies, if you get to the right uh, department within it or right person, also have goals that are consistent or we'll see how they can connect to your goals and benefit from them as well. So they'll want to participate. So a number of years ago, this actually has happened in Fairfield. I had one of a um, professor of urban planning at ISU. Actually did an entire, he had an entire undergraduate semester class did nothing but do an evaluation of the codes for Fairfield. And it was absolutely brilliant. I don't know what we've done with it, but we should find that thing because we're in the process of thinking through actually having an official code rather than defaulting to national codes. But yeah, I would, I would love to actually work with you, uh, Richard, and, and, and really think through and all of the students and their wonderful teacher. Yeah, I think we could harness a lot of energy, and we could do real work, not just, not just school work. We could do real work. So, My question is about, um, it sort of has different facets to it, but one is about leadership and where leadership comes from. And I've been involved in enough, I spent a career in community-based processes, that if you don't have the leadership and it's not solid, and it's not coming on multiple levels, a project won't be sustained over time. So I want you to comment on that, but what I was going to say is that in this room is a lot of the major leadership in Fairfield, and yet it's focused Sustainable Living Center. These students are the leadership in this community. Richard and Kay are the leadership in this community, but they're running a school. And part of what I'm trying to figure out is where is this network of leadership going to come from? Because it's not necessarily coming from the city itself. And, but you have to have that buy-in as well. So what does that look like? And something that we've been just discussing on the peripheral as a result of this forum is that could this, and we've been talking about both at the Marishi School and the Fairfield High School, could the kids in the high school come together and actually start to create a sustainability plan and take it and sell it to the city council, take it and sell it to the county? Could they learn that process, take it and sell it to the community? So, you know, we all know visioning and mapping, and those are all sort of standard planning processes. We can do that. We've got that. That's no big deal, actually. That's standard procedure. The question is, how can the leadership start to come from where you don't expect it to come from because we don't have it in the obvious places? And so I just wanted to ask you, if you're looking at the leadership all the way around here in different capacities, but not in the way that you would think it would be to support a sustainability initiative, how is that going to work? And I see it, I see it over in this corner is where I see it, but I see it, it also coming from the support over here because they are willing and in the, in the superintendent of schools for the public school system is willing. There's some teachers within the Fairfield High School as well who are willing. That's where our leadership is coming from. That's where our strengths are right now. So I just wanted you to comment on building that network of leadership that's gonna be needed because I can't remember whose presentation it was, but all of you alluded to patience, perseverance, <laughs> and do it again and again and again. And so you know what it takes. It's not just creating a plan. It is implementing and then taking it to the next iteration and the next iteration. So you need that, that constant um, 
influx and support from leadership. And so if you wouldn't mind commenting on that, it's so key to where we go. Yeah. I think the present, oh, is it working? properly okay I think the presentations definitely inspired a lot of people I know after talking with my classmates um, after the presentation today a lot of them felt more inspired because I know a lot of them were kind of like yeah I want to be sustainable but I don't know it kind of seems like too much work I want to enjoy my youth let me just kind of like leave that for later but I think after today a lot of them were kind of really like two of my classmates went up and asked really um, good questions, which was very surprising because they weren't really interested at first, which showed how much of an effect um, your presentations had on them. So I think definitely we could work on joining with FHS um, and seeing if we can start making a group of people my age and in the high school, maybe even middle school if we wanted to, to kind of come up with a plan to make Fairfield more sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I think that would definitely um, be something that we could work on. I was going to say the similar thing. I think action speaks louder than words. So um, students taking their actions and actually planning on things that make um, Fairfield and also the whole world be more sustainable and also climate change is a very effective thing. I think your presentation had a really big influence on us too and also other students that we know of. So yes, we appreciate it. Thank you. I think we've identified that what has to happen is that the Go Green Commission that we were going to wait and present and uh, create once we had a sustainability coordinator, that has to come first. First we start with the Go Green Commission and those people are going to start it for us, the young people. And they bring it up and say, so what's the hold up? We've got a, pl we got a plan. Where's your sustainability coordinator? How are we going to implement it? I think that's what we've identified. I think it's a great idea. So I believe, Jeff, it was in your presentation that you talked about um, backlash. <laughs> People who weren't uh, spoken with or encouraged somehow beforehand and then, um, yeah, so, and you showed a great articles from the paper and so forth like that. We've only had one of those so far. And then I believe I was speaking with Mary and we were talking about communicating with different people, not necessarily the choir who, and so forth. And you talked to me, I believe it was you, about church groups. Was that correct? And how important that was in Iowa. Um, so you'd think I was going to ask a question about that. But what I'm driving at is the communication piece is in some ways the most difficult in terms of communicating with people who aren't already of your viewpoint. And particularly with businesses who the, they're looking at a bottom line that's a little different. And if you can't always convince them that going a sustainable route or I don't you know, what I heard from you is that you small immediate rewards possibilities with groups like that. Um, which you couldn't necessarily be with church groups. But in both cases, I'd like to have you speak just a little bit about, if you would, or if group thinks it's important, about how you're successful with these two particular groups. Businesses, um, it can be a large business like, you know, construction. Um, it could be metal, plastics, what have you. Um, and in the church groups as well particularly if you are not a member of that church group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Yeah, yes, it is important. I'm going to start with small business, and I'm going to go back to West Union since I was asked to focus on that a lot today. The whole concept of the district geothermal system sat almost dormant for a year. I mean, it was designed... It was ready to be built, but we didn't have anybody commit to connecting to the system. And what we found from those small businesses and the owners of those, well, that was part of the problem too. You had people had businesses in the buildings but didn't necessarily own the buildings. So you had business owners and you had building owners to, to work with. Um, but what we found, probably shouldn't have been much of a surprise, they're busy trying to run a business. <clears throat> and they don't have time to do the research. They don't have time to figure out what is this going to save me or what is this going to cost me. So the strategic step we took, and it really jump-started it, 
is we, through uh, Main Street West Union, applied to the USDA. They have a Rural Energy Assistance Program, or REAP. And we applied for some funding to actually take, and we knew we had 21 businesses that were interested. And we sought grant funding through USDA to actually go into those businesses, do those blower door testing, do the energy audits, provide them some assistance to make the energy improvements. But then the other key piece was we were able to bring in a mechanical and electrical engineering firm who went into each of those buildings, looked at their current systems, kind of drew up a schematic of here's what you would have to do to your building to connect to the geothermal system. Here's what we think the cost would be. Here's what we think the simple payback would be. And here are some funding sources like the rebate programs to help you. And once the 2021 properties had that information, that was what they needed to decide. And we got about a half of them went forward with the project. But it went from nothing going on for over a year to a month or two after having those reports done that then the action really happened. So that's, a, I think, is a good example of it's going to take a lot of hand holding, frankly, for the small, the smaller business. Um, Churches, um, other than, I haven't worked with too many churches that weren't my own. I had great luck with my own church on some community garden, food insecurity, lots of those kind of efforts. I'm still working them on solar though. We should be, we should have solar. I haven't gotten convinced my own church yet. And it makes so much sense, so. So the um, interfaith, um, Light and Power um, organization, um, I think, has a, a lot of uh, real great connection. And certainly we had a chapter in the Ames community. And I would, I would absolutely agree with Jeff. I think these are both vital connections to make. They are important pieces of the community. And not only, you know, are the, um, the folks that are related to the businesses and the churches um, you know, uh, managing operations within those entities. Um, they, they also, you know, um, have their own homes that they're managing. They're teaching, um, you know, the next generation, um, in habits and, and in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in, um, uh, day-to-day -day decision making. So one thing that was particularly significant for us was in our, you know, the the sustainability plan related to reduction in electrical consumption. That that was my first piece to you know really tackle as a sustainability coordinator was um, you know directly related and had such an important focus on ensuring that there was representation from each of our primary sectors in the community. But it didn't stop at having someone represent the business community. It was then extended, and they were charged with gathering their constituents in a subcommittee of that sector. And then for those constituents to reach out within their sector toward developing their own plan of their own action items that they felt were important to them. And the churches really, um, you know, we had a, um, and of course you need real strong leaders, you know, within that sector committee, but with the charge of, okay, we're going to be developing a plan, but we want to make sure that it represents your voice and your challenges and your goals. And um, so, you know, the, I think that that really puts the onerous on ensure your voice and your perspective is really incorporated within that. And we just, you know, we've had good, I think, um, the Smart Business Challenge has been a good peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sort of learning opportunity. The energy audits, I think, have been really eye-opening for folks. From our church standpoint, um, we had a lot of uh, community engagement discussions with churches, bringing in uh, our energy audit um, folks to talk about how an energy audit and energy opportunities within a church is very different than at home, because you basically are using the majority of your energy one day a week, and are, you know, are you going to have it really cold that day you know I mean you know so what changes can you make and yet they found ways to make meaningful um, change and still provide the services that they wanted to on a day-to-day -day basis so it's the ownership question that yes I think I think that direct connection to you you charting your your future right you know I think for a lot of the churches too there's obviously an environmental stewardship 
um, connection there for the, and that resonates. And um, I think also many churches struggle with uh, congregational member sizes at this point and how to keep the doors and the lights on. So if there's an opportunity to show some ways to save money through those energy efficiency improvements is probably one of those ways to, to get in the door. I, I, my church actually has been pretty progressive on that side. We have a large enough size that Mid-American Energy's got uh, some recommissioning programs that have assisted us in doing extensive amount of insulation and air sealing and relighting or relamping of the building that's saved quite a bit. And I think those are pretty easy sales. And I think a lot of churches connect with the whole issue of food security or insecurity issues. So I think that oftentimes that's an entryway into the churches as well. Uh, today really exceeded our expectations. I mean, we were so focused on getting people there for the last couple of weeks, 24 seven, we've lived and breathed trying to get people there in every way we could possibly think. Um, and uh, then today came and it was like, oh my God, I hope this lives up to everything. <laughs> and, it, and for me, it just far exceeded. Um, we, I think all of us felt like in every instance, it was a totally different flavor and we learned so much and it's, it's really what our community needs right at this time. And so, I mean, I, and then having the kids there too was, was awesome. So um, I just can't thank you enough personally because even though I talked to all of you, you don't know, you don't know what you're getting. <laughs> and, and it's just kind of like, and, and then, you know, Josh was on Zoom and he was so hard for us to connect with and we just like, okay, where is the, the, the live wire in this group? Where, where's the loose screw? But I can say that it was just, it couldn't have been better all the way around from my personal point of view. And I'm, I'm, I'm a person who cares about content more than all the other stuff. And I just um, wanna thank you. It's been tremendous and I hope we can keep the connection with you and not just those of us in this room. We're the kind of obvious suspects because we're the ones who are gonna make this move forward, quite honestly. But also, our mayor was there, our council members were there, uh, some of our county supervisors were there. We want them to look at you guys and say, hey, you know, this is a resource, this is where it's already been done, and that gives them ideas as well. And I have to say, our, um, our mayor took copious notes. She sat behind me, and um, she checked in with Michael quite a bit on the energy stuff. He's our energy czar, and um, I think that you filled everybody's heads today. So really thank you so much. And I'm sure everybody feels the same.